Hey, let's pray. We're going to jump into part five, Summer at Valley Rise. We're looking through the book of John. God, thank you today for your goodness and your mercy. God, thank you for every single person here. Thank you that you kept us safe, God, this week, that you brought us back. Thank you for all of the highs and lows of this last week, Jesus, that you've walked through with us. You've accompanied us every day, God, no matter what we had this week. You've carried us through it. And moments where, God, we thought, how are we going to or what's going to? God, you've been faithful. Thank you. God, we love you, we worship you, we praise you. I pray today that you would draw us closer to you and closer to each other. Speak to us, I pray today. Let's leave here transformed by your words. In Jesus' mighty, powerful name, and everybody said amen and amen. Well, hey, we are in July. It is the first Sunday of July. We're seven months in. How many remember the first month of the year? In January, I stood up here and I said, it's month one, and if this year is the best year of your life, spiritually, it'll be the best year of your life. Okay, I've done that every month. So now we're in July. You're seven months in. Doesn't that happen fast? Seven months in. So the question I have for you is, does 2023 look different than 2022 looked? And if not, then what do you need to do on the back end to make sure that your year is different? What habits and disciplines, what new things do you need to put into your schedule so that the back five months of this year look better than the first seven months of this year? Remember, if we're not intentionally working, intentionally growing, if we're not intentional with these things, a year will fly by and you'll go, oh my God, where'd that year go? You ever been there? I've been there, wasted some years only to go, man, I could have learned, grown, got better, been stronger internally, externally, relationally if I would have just been intentional with my time. So you're seven months in. Hopefully your spiritual growth is doing well. If you're gauging yourself this year, gauge yourself on that. How is my spiritual growth this year? How am I leaning into what God wants to do inside of me? Am I getting great time with Jesus? Is exciting things happening? Am I spending quality time with him and he's refreshing me? What does your spiritual growth look like? How many of you would like to grow more than you've grown this year so far? How many of you, would well, maybe you feel stuck this year. Maybe you hear you just go, man, Christian, I just feel stuck. I just feel like I just, it's been a year of just spinning my wheels. I want to give you some initiative today to help us in the next five months grow and to continue to keep our focus on what God wants to do in and through us this year. We're in John 5. John 5. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethsaida having five porches, and that means what they're saying is a big pool. This was, a, this was a, a resort pool, having five porches, and in these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, and paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. I want you to hear this. So there was this pool, and once a year, an angel would come down, and he would touch the water, and when he did, the water would begin to stir, it would begin to bubble. And when the water began to bubble, if you were the first person into the water, you were healed. So sick people would lay around here all day long, waiting for the moment when the water was going to bubble, and they would have the chance to get in. This is where we find Jesus walking into this great multitude of sick people, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel would go down, and when he touched it, whoever was the first in would win. All I want you to think of this. All of these people are laying there, sick, maimed, lame, blind, paralyzed, waiting for something to happen. They're waiting for some external circumstance to change their condition. I want you to hear this this morning. All of them are there waiting for external circumstances to change their condition condition. Maybe you're here in July going, man, if I'd have had a better job this year, man, if I'd have got this break, man, if that thing would have happened for me, man, if someone could have done this or not done this for me, I'd be at a different place. Waiting on exterior things to change their lives. You know people like that who hang out in the one day? You know what that is, right? One day I'm going to get it. I'm telling you, one day I have this idea. One day I'm going to figure it out and I'm going to make this, I'm going to get my big break and then everything's going to be good. One day somebody's going to find me and find out that I'm the most talented at this and then, and then I'm going I'm to make my way. If only this could happen. Do you know people like that that hang out in the one days 
waiting for some exterior situation to change their circumstances. Maybe you've been there. I've been there. You know what happens when you hang out in the one days on this earth? You surround yourself with sick people. You surround yourself with sick people. Let's talk about some of the sick people that were there. There was some blind people, it says. It says, here lays a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, and paralyzed. I just want to take one moment and remind you that if you're not intentional with your life, you will end up in the same place around blind people. You know what blind people have? What do they have? No vision. No vision for their life. No vision for what God wants to do in them or through them. They're blinded to everything that's happening around them because all they can see is their current circumstances or pain. Blind people. He said there was lame people there. You know, lame people, right? Let me show you what lame people sound like today. Lame people sound like, well, if my boss wouldn't have done that to me, then I'd have been someplace else by now. Well, if my spouse would have helped me there in my first marriage, and I wouldn't be on my third marriage, and it wouldn't be like this. Well, if my mom or dad would have done this or wouldn't have done this, then lame people, people who have been lame because of things other people have done, they like to play the blame game. If someone would have, if someone could have, if they would have helped me, then I would have been able to. Lame people. And then lastly, he says paralyzed people. You know what paralyzed people don't do? They don't move. Hanging around in one days in your life will keep you around people that aren't going anywhere. It will keep you around people that are spinning their wheels, people that aren't going anywhere in life. It will keep you indecisive. Indecisiveness will keep you paralyzed. This is where Jesus walks into. He walks into people that are in this physical condition, but there's a spiritual attachment to this physical condition. And the spiritual attachment is the same thing. If you're blind and can't see, then you have no vision for your life either oftentimes. And Jesus is walking into these things, and he sees a man... Now, a certain man was there who had an infirmity of 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? I want you to hear this, 38 years of sickness, 38 years of infirmity, 38 years of waiting for the water to be stirred up. This man is laying there, and now he has an interaction with someone who can change everything. He says, do you wish to be made well? The sick man answered him, and, and I love the King James version of this. Let me put up the King James of this one verse. It says, the impotent man answered him. I, sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me in the pool, but while I'm coming, another steppeth down before me. I love that it says impotent. You know what impotent means? You know what the definition of impotent is? Unable to take effective action, helpless or powerless. Sad reality is that describes so many of us in our spiritual condition today. Unable to take effective action, helpless or powerless. And God looks down and says, do you want to be made well? This seems like a, a very common, like, like obviously Jesus, he wants to be made well. He's laying here, 38 years he's been laying here. Clearly Jesus, he wants to be made well. But you know what's interesting is Jesus, before any time he ever heals someone, asks them the same thing. It's always the same thing. It sounds a little different. It'll sound like, do you believe you can be made well? Do you believe I can heal you? Do you believe you can be made whole? Do you have faith to be made whole? Jesus always asks, because the great thing about Jesus is he'll never bypass your free will. Jesus is never going to put you on like a puppet and go, okay, here's what you're going to do today. Say this, talk like this, be nice, don't say that, don't do that. Here's what you need to do, and at the end, I'll take you off and put you in your bed, and I'll put you right back on tomorrow morning. That's what some of us think God's going to do in our life, that we give him our life. And it's like, God, I don't know why my life's not getting better. Jesus walks up and says, do you want to be made well? You know what the truth is? For any of our lives to grow, you've got to want more of Jesus. For your life to get better, for your life to grow, you've got to want more. This is what Jesus is asking this man. Do you want more? He walks up, and the man's laying there in a crowd of a bunch of other sick people sitting next to a pool, and this was their life. Someone would come feed them, take care of them, leave them there, and then come back and do that when they couldn't do it for themselves. And Jesus walks up to him. He says, do you want more out of life? Do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be fully functioning? Do you want to be healthy? Do you want to be back to whole? 
Hey, can I ask you this morning, do you want more for your life? Are you content like the lame man laying next to the pool, or do you desire more? Do you want more of Jesus? Do you want more of his freedom in your life? Do you want him to do amazing things through you? This is what Jesus is asking this man. Do you want to be made well? The impotent man answered him. Remember, impotent. Why is he impotent? Because he's unable to take effective action. Helpless or powerless. Maybe you felt like that this year. Maybe January it was, I'm going to have the best year ever. But March you felt impotent, unable to take effective action. Powerless. Maybe something hit you in the middle of the year that you didn't expect and you felt powerless or helpless to it. And what started off with initiative has turned into impotence. Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool. I love this because we do the same thing that he does to Jesus. Oftentimes when you talk to people about the areas of their lives that are lame and broken and maimed, their first response is an excuse. Why does your marriage look so broken? Well, Pat, if you only knew how difficult my wife was. I mean, my God, let me just tell you. Hey, man, why do you have that attitude? Every time I see you, you have a bad attitude. Well, if you had my life, you'd know, too, how bad it was and how hard it was. You'd be acting the same way I was acting if you had to go through what I had to go through. Do you want to be made whole? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me in the water. Oftentimes, our own reaction to our impotence is excuses. Excuses for why we're that way. Excuses for how our parents made us that way. Excuses for why we wanted to do that. Why we feel like we're obligated to or allowed to. Excuses. Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm going down, another steps down before me. My grandfather used to always say, Christian, a man with a desire will always find a way. A man with a desire not to will always find an excuse. A man with a desire will always find a way. A man with a desire not to will always find an excuse. Jesus is looking at this man saying, do you want to be made well? He's looking into the creator of the universe's face and he begins to give him excuses. It sounds silly, but how often do we do that? When God goes, hey, I want that part of your life. And you go, yeah, yeah, God, but listen, it's just not, it's just, but you, you're, it's just not ready yet, God. Yeah, well, give me this relationship. God, God, no, 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 listen, I'm just going to let it go a little longer, and then I'll see you, and I'll decide, and then I'll let you do your thing, God. We love to give God excuses of why we're impotent, of why we're unhealthy, of why we're not whole, instead of just responding to Jesus. You know what's awesome is Jesus will give you the desire, but let me help you out today. He will not give you the self-discipline. That comes from you. Jesus will give you desire, but he will not discipline you. I'll never forget being in high school and like all guys trying to work on my eyes and the enemy attacking my eyes. And I remember in a small group one day with one of my buddies and we were talking about this bunch of guys. Man, the enemy attacking our eyes. I always want to look at girls. I always look at... How do you stop? How do you make yourself not want to do that? How do you, and I'll never forget one of the guys in this group, we're having this conversation, and the guy goes, well, yeah, but like it just, sometimes when I'm alone, and then sometimes when I'm this, and, sometimes, and finally one of my best friends looks at the guy, he goes, okay, I'm going to be honest with you. At some point, you do have to practice self-control a little bit. <laughs> like Jesus isn't going to do it all for you. You got to use like a little bit of self-control. You got to resist him a little bit. At some point, it's on you. Jesus will give you desire, but he will never discipline you for you. Only you can discipline you. And the first great discipline all of us learn on this planet, all of us should learn, is self-discipline. The ability to discipline myself. You know what self-discipline leads to? It leads to a healthy life of good habits. Self-discipline is what makes me open up my Bible first before anything else in the morning. Self-discipline is what makes me eat right when I don't want to and I want to eat sugar. Self-discipline is what helps me from saying things that are wise to people instead of frustration that comes out and wants to come out. Self-discipline, the first great discipline all of us will learn on this earth is self-discipline. And this is what Jesus is asking him. Do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be healthy? The man responded, I have no one to put me there. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed, and walk. You know what I love right here is Jesus will invite you in to healing, but he will never drag you. Jesus will invite you into a life of healing. Would you like a healthy marriage? Would you like a great family? Would you like a better relational circle? Would you like healthy finances? Would you like healthy thought process? Would you like to be whole and healthy? 
rise, take up your bed, and walk. And then all of a sudden in this moment, and immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. I just think of this moment where this man is sitting there because he had an option in this moment. He could believe he was healed and get up and do it, or he could sit there and go, Jesus, my legs haven't worked in 38 years. What are you talking about? I was a medic in the Air Force for four years. I've taken people through physical therapy. I've seen people with wounds and injuries. And You don't just walk, not walk for 38 years and then start walking. You got to have some physical therapy. You got to have some rehab. You got to have some muscle building. You got to do some exercises and some stretches. This man could have given all of those excuses and they would have been reasonable and logical. But in this moment, this man chooses a different reaction. He chooses initiative. An initiative separates dreamers from achievers. I want you to hear this this morning. Initiative separates dreamers from achievers. This man could have stayed there and thought, golly, how crazy was Jesus told me to just jump up and walk out. Or he could have taken the initiative to grab his mat and stand up like Jesus asked him to. Oftentimes, this is the struggle we have in life. There's areas of our life that are lame and broken and maimed. And us, like the man at the well, we like to lay around and go, if someone could help me figure this out, then maybe one day I'd be better. You know what the truth is? Jesus looks at all of us and says, no, healing is on you. You've got to pursue healing. You've got to pursue wholeness. You've got to learn to discipline yourself. You've got to plug into the power of God. He can't do that part for you. He can heal you. He can renew you. He can restore you. He can save you. But he can't make you get out of bed in the morning and fill yourself with his word. He can't make you put on good things and fill your mind with good things instead of bad things. He can't make you change your friend circle. He can give you the love to do all of those things, but he will never discipline you for you. Only you can do that. First great discipline we learn is self-discipline, and Jesus invites him into a life of discipline. The man, in a moment of initiation, rises and takes up his bed and walks in initiative. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. I love this because you know what the truth is for all of us? There will always be people willing to stand between you and your healing. There will always be people willing to stand between you and your healing. When people see you with their mat, it makes unhealthy people mad. Let me tell you what it looks like. Man, my marriage was falling apart, but now it's phenomenal. And you should just see what God's doing in our marriage. And it's awesome. We just have like the greatest marriage ever. And here come the Pharisees. Uh Uh-huh. But two months ago, he was talking to other girls. And everything was falling apart. And now it's good. Sure, let's see how long it lasts. Man, I've just been, God's been doing great stuff in me. And man, I'm hearing differently. I'm seeing differently. God, uh uh-huh, let's just see how long that Jesus kick lasts for you. Oh, you're getting religious now, huh? Oh, you're going to find church in God? Okay. There will always be people willing to stand between you and your healing. You know why? Because healthy people make unhealthy people insecure. Healthy people make unhealthy people insecure. Because you just walk with your head up and you walk connected to Jesus. And they how can you do that? Because I'm connected to Jesus. Well, you shouldn't feel that self. Hey, if people knew what I knew about you, that's okay if you knew what Jesus knew about me. Healthy people cause unhealthy people to feel insecure. Sick people hate seeing well people carry their bed. They hate it. They'd love for you to be stuck next to the pool trying to get better for a long time. They'd love to see you continuing to try and figure it out. They'd love to see you hopeless and helpless. No, you have an opportunity to plug into Jesus, to rise, take up your mat, and walk. This is the moment that Jesus has with this man. He took up his bed and was cured. The Pharisees who saw him said, it's the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them and said to them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who is the man? Don't don't you love it? It doesn't matter what other people say when Jesus speaks to you. Jesus speaks to him and says, Take up your bed and walk. They come and go, You can't do that. And he goes, It's too late. Somebody already healed me. It's too late. I've already been made whole. It's too late. I already stood up and walked and picked up my mat. But the one who healed was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. 
Oftentimes, this verse is misconstrued. People hear this like they hear their grandmother. Uh huh. You do bad, God's gonna get you. That's how we hear you. Or maybe you have a grandmother like that. Uh huh. God's always watching. And if he sees you, he's gonna get you. <laughs> oh, God, what does that mean? I live my life that way. And every time someone goes bad, you finally be like, okay, thank God. God finally got me back for what I did last week. Now we're even. I can start over again today. <laughs> Any of y'all grow up like that? I mean, I'm dead serious. That's how I felt for a long time. Someone go bad. Not just that was for that last week. Okay, that makes sense. Now I just, hey, no, that's not what God designs for us. See, you've been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. You know what Jesus is saying to him? Once you've learned how to live a healthy life, once you've learned what being whole looks like, sin becomes a consequence of its own. Sin is its own consequence to our life. People have such a hard time figuring this out. Oftentimes, people will say things like this to me. Pastor, God really got me. I got my girlfriend pregnant. Time out. You were doing the thing you do when you want to get pregnant, and you got pregnant, and God got you? No, I think you got you. I think that's on you. Pastor, I need you to come pray for me. I'm in the jail. I got my third DUI. God really got me this time. No, you drank 12 beers and drove and got a DUI. You got you. Oftentimes, we want to put these consequences on God. How many of you know sin is a consequence of its own? This is what Jesus is saying to him. He's going, if you don't learn how to live a healthy whole life, sin will drag you into a lifestyle that's way worse than being maimed with your legs. Sin will ruin your relationships, and sin will take you away from your spouse, and sin will make you see people differently, and sin will erode the inside of you. If you keep chasing sin, it will lead you someplace worse than physical malady will do to you. This is what Jesus is saying to him. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made them well. I love this. We go down and Jesus begins to have a conversation with the Pharisees. I encourage you to go and read the back half of chapter 5 of John because Jesus talks for a little while and it's a lot to read, but he says some phenomenal stuff, but he ends it with this in John 5, 39. He says, you search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life. Did you hear this? He's talking to Pharisees whose whole life has been studying scripture. And he says, you spend all of your time studying the word and studying the word and trying to figure it out because you think that's how you're going to get eternal life. But the scriptures point to me, yet you refuse to come to me to receive this life. Do you know every day we have an option of how we live on this earth? If we're going to choose life or death, and every day we get that option to choose now, I want to be careful here because, if we, actually, hold on, let me see. Every day we have an option to choose how we live. I want to give you three areas to choose life in this week that will change your life. Three areas to start thinking of. you got five months left in this year. I want to give you three areas that if you'll take initiative, they will change your life. It'll look different. Because remember, you can't get a different life laying next to the same old hot tub. You got to get up. You got to do different things. There's got to be initiative in the inside of you. You got to begin to discipline yourself differently. Three areas to choose life in that will change your life this morning. Number one, life giving time. Hey, what does your time look like? You ever find yourself just wasting time? Your life giving time. Have you ever heard your grandparents say, idle hands are the devil's workshop? Come on. Y'all know idle hands are the devil's workshop. What are you doing with your free time? Because the truth is, if you don't fill your free time, trust me, the enemy will. If you don't fill your free time, he's looking for opportunities and doors in to try and fill your life and mind with things. Like, I'll give you a great one. What are you watching and listening to? Whatever you watch and listen to, those things are going to affect you. That's how you're going to feel. I was meeting with a guy the other day, and he was telling me about his marriage. And his wife goes, he's just always so sad, and he's always so depressed, and he's just never happy. And I go, well, tell me about your day. Tell them about your disciplines. Tell them about your habits. What do you, anytime people can't figure it out, you got to get into their disciplines and habits because it's our actions that create the, the, the choices you're living with. Okay. So then you go, well, let's get into why you're feeling that way. Well, I wake up in the morning and tell me your routine. I put on death metal. Oh, okay. Well, I'm sure that's fulfilling. And then what do you do? I listen to it all day long. How much death metal would you say you listen to in a day? Oh, at least easy 12 hours. Oh, I think we found the problem. <laughs> If all you're listening to is death metal that makes you want to kill yourself and kill other people, it doesn't surprise me that you feel depressed. Whatever you fill your time with, fill your mind with, fill your eyes with, that's what you're going to feel like. You understand that? 
Whatever you fill your life with, fill your time with, and fill your mind with, that's what you're going to feel like. So if you don't like the way you feel, then fill yourself with different things. What are you watching and listening to? The life-giving time. Work on your time this week. Number two, life-giving relationships. How many of you know the people you surround yourself with shape you? Don't think for one second that lame man didn't have friends that he grew up with. Don't think for one second that lame man didn't have a family that would come feed him every day and go, no, no, just stay here because it's easy to take care of you while you're here. It's easy to deal with you when you're sick. It's easy to take care of you when you're, when you're lame. We just come back to the same place and feed you, and that's okay. You just stay there. What if one of his friends said, hey, man, I think there's more for you. Hey, man, I think you can do more than what's happening right here. I think God's got a plan for your life. Man, I think there's something amazing that could happen. I mean, I heard Jesus was out on the countryside. Let's go see if we could find him. I'd love to preach the difference in the story between this and the man whose friends took him up on the roof and opened up the roof and brought him down in front of Jesus. You want to talk about the difference between good friend circles? One of his friend circles brought him and put him right in front of Jesus and said, no, you got to heal our friend. The other one's family and friends were content to let him lay by the pool for 38 years. The people in your life will not always push you to the best for your life. You've got to get that from Jesus. Life-giving relationships. Are you intentionally picking your relationships? Are you finding yourself just in the ones that come your way? Intentionally surrounding yourself with good people. Let me ask you this. Are you pursuing good relationships today? What's pursuing good relationships? Are there people you're pursuing that you know are going to build your life? Hey, I need to find someone who has something I need. They got a better marriage than me. They got a better business than me. They got better friendships than me. I need to get around them so I can learn how to do what they do. I need to be intentionally pursuing people that are going to help me grow in my life. Number one, life-giving time. Two, life-giving relationships. Three, life-giving disciplines and habits. Listen, this is the key for some of you this morning. Some of you that feel like, I just feel like I can't get traction. I feel like I keep spinning my wheels. I feel like I'm in the same season of life over and over and over and over and over. This is for you. Write this down this morning. Consistency is the traction of life. Consistency is the traction of life. Let me give you the secret to success that only successful people know. There is no secret. You keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over consistently, and one day people call you successful. You keep doing the same thing, and then one day go, how'd you build a great church? Because every Sunday we had church for like 15 years, and then finally people started showing up. Because every day we woke up and spent time together in our marriage, and then our marriage got better. Because every day I went to the gym, and then I started to feel better about myself. And then every day I started to read the Word of God, and my mind started to change. God will give you desire to love Him, but He will not give you the discipline. You've got to do that. You've got to discipline yourself. You've got to wake up tomorrow and go, I'm doing new habits that are going to lead to better results on the other side. So the question this morning for you is, what habits are you doing tomorrow? What new habits are you starting? They're going to change your week this week. You can't do the same thing you did last week and have a different week. You'll get frustrated. Some of you are frustrated because that's how your life works. You do the same thing every week and the results are the same and it's frustrating. If you want different results, you've got to do different things. Because my actions are a reflection in my heart. Did you hear this? My actions are a reflection in my heart. If my heart longs to be close to Jesus, every day I'm going to wake up and go, God, I've got to find a way to get close to you i got to find a way to get your word in me. i got to find a way to get your life in me. i got to find a way to get relationships around me, God. Because I know there's a lot of people laying around the pool. I want you to hear what it says at the beginning. In these lay a great multitude of sick people. Purposeless is a pool that a lot of people live around. Okay, But you don't have to. Your actions are a reflection of your heart. And your actions don't prove your love to Jesus. I want you to hear what I'm going to say this morning. Your actions do not prove your love to Jesus, but they do prove your love for Jesus to other people. Okay, It's because you can say you love Jesus all you want, but if you're a jerk to people, they won't believe you. My actions don't show God I love him. It shows people I love God. Yeah, it's a great time. Thank you. I appreciate you. You helped me out back there. But I want to be careful because I don't want you to let religion sneak in. Because there's a line, and this is the life-giving tension that we love at Valley Rise, which is we don't got to, we get to. 
We don't have to wake up in the morning and spend time with Jesus. We get to wake up in the morning and spend time with Jesus. We don't have to spend time investing into our marriages. We get to spend time investing into our marriages. We don't have to work on being healthy. We get to work on being healthy. It's a different mindset. And if we're not careful, we'll begin to make it an action thing. Let me show people how much I love God. Let me show God how much I love God. And let me just do, 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 do so that everybody can see how good I am. No, that's not the heart either. I want to give you the heart. James describes it perfectly in James 2. As I close, here's what James says. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Listen to what he's saying. He's saying if your life isn't different, who does that help? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say goodbye, have a good day, stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. So what he's saying, we know that salvation comes by faith alone in Jesus. But what he's saying is, you can't say you've got this great relationship with Jesus if your actions lead to death. Because everything connected to Jesus leads to life. So that means there's parts of you that you need to prune. And you need to cut off. And you need to discipline. And you need to refine. And you need to allow God to remove. So that what comes out of you looks like Jesus. Can that kind of faith save anyone? Um, but then you don't give any person that food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now, someone may argue some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? You know what he's saying? You can't even do good things unless your heart's connected to the right place. It's impossible to live a life like that. Because you know what? Outside of Jesus, you know what all of us are innately? Selfish. All of us innately outside of Jesus are selfish. We're thinking about us. We're thinking about what we need. We're thinking about how we can get better. We're thinking about how we can improve. We're thinking about how we can grow. How we, and this is what he says. No, unless it produces good deeds, it's dead and useless. Now, some of may argue some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith. I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith, for you believe that there's one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this. And they tremble in terror. Do you understand what James is saying? He's saying it's not enough to believe in God. Everybody believes in God. The demons know God's real. Can you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete and so it happened just as the scriptures say Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith he was even called the friend of God so you see we are shown to be right with God by what we do not by faith alone Rahab the prostitute is another example she was shown to be right with God by her actions when she hid the messengers and sent them safely away by a different road just as the body is dead without breath so also faith is dead without good works you know what James saying? It's awesome to say you love Jesus, but if it does not produce life change inside of you, you're not connected to the source of life. It's impossible to grab live, open electrical wires and not get shocked, right? Anybody's ever done it? You grabbed one of those things and nothing happened, you know what you'd say? There's no power, there's no electricity, there's nothing coming through. That's what happens when people get religion and not Jesus. They grab on to dead power cords. And they go, change my life. And it doesn't. They go, make my marriage better. And it doesn't. But when you grab on to Jesus, when you wake up tomorrow and, and have different habits, what are you going to do differently tomorrow than you did today? That you're going to get up and spend time with him and you're going to put your word in him, his word in you. And you're going to grab onto those power cords and you're going to go, God, let me live a different life through you today. Not because I can or I'm good enough, but because I'm connected to the source of life. When I'm connected to you, I can do anything. Maybe you're here this morning and you feel like the guy at the pool of Bethesda. Maybe you feel like this year you've just been laying there. Maybe you can't get your traction. You're just spinning your wheels trying to figure out what God has for you and it feels like there's parts of your life that are lame and broken that will stop you from ever getting to it. I want to encourage you with the same encouragement that the lame man had. 
Do you know the word Bethsaida in Hebrew means house of grace? Love it. So when they came for healing, they were coming to the house of grace. You know what this is? A house of grace. And we get to show up here with all of our brokenness and our wounds and our maims and our blindness and our paralyzation and our areas that are broken. And we get to go, God, I need you to heal me. I need you to do for me what you did for the lame man. Jesus, I believe you can. And I'm not going to just give you my belief. I'm going to give you my actions. I'm going to grab my mat. And I'm going to get up and begin to walk. Not because I think that I can, but because you said that I can, Jesus. And I can do anything you say that I can do. This week you get to start. You get to have a different week tomorrow. Because you're going to have different habits. Not because you have to, but because you get to. Connect your life to the greatest source of power that exists on this planet or anywhere in the universe. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? God, thank you today for your goodness and your mercy and your grace, God. Thank you that this is a house of grace. That God, when we find ourselves broken and lame and hurting, that we can come to your feet and we can request healing and we can request, Jesus, your strength that our lives need to be able to do what you created us to do. God, forgive us for, for excuses that we've put up of why we can't be healthy. Excuses of why we're lame or blind or paralyzed instead of trusting in your word and picking up our mat and following after you, Jesus. Forgive us for our unbelief in those moments. With every head bowed and every eye closed, there may be those of you here that say, Christian, man, I feel like that's me. I feel like the lame man. I, I need a healing. I need new life inside of my bones. I need God to breathe inside of me so that fresh life can come out of me. My actions have to change, and my habits and my disciplines need to be different, but I know I can't do that on my own. I need Jesus to do that. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I just want to pray for those of you that say, Christian, that's me, man. I feel like the, the lame man next to the pool, but today I want to be different. Today I want to pick my mat up and walk out of here filled with the power of God. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If that's you and you say, Christian, would you just pray for me today? I need that. Would you just slip your hand up right now so I can pray with you? Amen. Amen. You can put your hands down. God, thank you for each and every person that raised their hands. God, you know. You know the situations. You know the heartache. You know the relationships. God, you know the areas that need to be healed. Today, Jesus, we speak healing over them. God, we want life from you. And so we say, yes, God. We receive it. We're going to walk out of your change, transformed, God, starting new habits, new patterns, new disciplines in our life so that we're not maimed for the next 38 years. We're filled with life and purpose, Jesus activated on this planet to make a difference for you. Jesus, I pray that you would heal every situation, restore every situation, refresh every situation. Jesus, I pray that your power would fill them like only you can do, and that they would go from this place living a different life, excited by all that you want to do in and through them. Now, if you're here this morning, maybe you say, Christian, that sounds great, man, but I've never, I've never had that relationship with Jesus. Maybe you've experienced church, you've experienced religion, but you've never encountered a genuine relationship with the creator of the universe. Not based off if you could perform or be good enough. Simply based off of what he did on the cross for you and your need for him. If that's you today and you say, Christian, I need to pray that prayer. I want to start my relationship with Jesus for the first time. Would you just slip your hand up right now so I can pray with you right where you're at? Amen. Amen. You can put your hands down. And at Valley Rise, we pray this all together. So you can pray it out loud. You can say it under your breath. You can pray it in your heart. As long as you mean it is what we ask. Would you repeat after me? Dear Lord Jesus, today I recognize my need for you. Jesus, I believe that you're the Son of God. That you came from heaven to earth to live a perfect life. A life I never could have lived. But you did it so that I wouldn't have to. Thank you, Jesus. And Jesus, I believe you went to the cross to pay for my sin bill so that I wouldn't have to. Thank you, Jesus. I receive your gift. And then, Jesus, I believe on the third day that you rose from the grave to give me new life, hope, and freedom. Today, Jesus, I choose you. I choose to love you. I choose to serve you. I choose to seek you all the days of my life. In Jesus' precious name, and everyone said, amen. Would you hand to those who just made the greatest decision in their lives? Amen, 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 amen.
Amen. Hey, I encourage you, get some good habits. Tomorrow, have a different day. Your day changes when your habits change. So set your clock a little early. Get up, spend some time in the Word, put on worship music, fill your mind with good stuff, and watch how your day changes. It's amazing when you start doing the little disciplines and habits in your life consistently, day after day after day after day, how much progress you make without realizing it. Consistency is the traction of your life. Get some consistent habits this week, and let's watch what God does.